that anytime there's something like this that happens, the people have a tendency to turn back to Christ. So we pray that even some that are lukewarm, that haven't been around God for a while, kind of return back to him. We believe others that have never received him will be will receive him. Uh, it's amazing out there what's going on. We had a picture of a our son that lives in South Carolina, and he had a sh picture of the shelves in a store, empty, where all the toilet papers used to be. We've seen on Facebook where they have a commemorative uh, earrings, and they just, earrings with toilet paper. <laughs> to remember in 2020 what had happened, I'm thinking everybody gets in <laughs> to the program. I thought, oh, wow. But the reality is, if people knew the truth about Jesus Christ and what he did on his, when he was, he was sacrificed. When he took the stripes on his back, and I've said this before, there's 39 basic viruses known to man. Now there might be some more that they're trying to make, I don't know, but basically there's only 39 basic viruses according to the science. From the time the stethoscope was involved until today, only 39. Uh, different names through the different centuries, called different things, but when they look at the actual structure of it, it's only 39 viruses. Jesus took 39 stripes on his back. See, when we realize about the kingdom of God, which we teach about, it's all about authority. It's all about authority, and I was amazed when when you find out about the authority, what happens is you immediately take and, and realize it's Jesus took the authority over those diseases, those 39 diseases in this earth today. And he cut them off, destroyed the power and authority of those 39, 39 stripes. Now you might say, what does that have to do with me? Because Jesus did what he had to do for his body. It happened on his physical body, but is, it is implemented into his spiritual body. And who is a spiritual body? Anybody that accepts Jesus Christ in their life becomes a spiritual body. We are the body of Christ. So spiritually, it has no power and authority over us. Physically, it can jump on us. But if we take the authority through Jesus Christ and apply his word and just say you have no legal rights to me because Jesus took every legal right of every disease and broke its power, broke its authority, you can say the same thing. I haven't had a disease for quite a while. Now I'm going to tell you a caution on that when you start to make a confession. The devil hears what you say and he says, aha, I got him. I'm going after him and prove them wrong. So the first thing he does is try to make you sick. So Father, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. But I also, when found out when I say something like that, it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit on me. But about two years ago, I had the sickness was coming in. It was so bad around. And it hit me. I didn't say anything. It just hit me. And I says, God, I can't put up with this for it was a day and a half where I took and I literally just kept rebuking, breaking, putting the word of God by his stripes, I'm healed. Devil, you have no authority. Jesus took it on the cross. You're dead. You have no right to my body because I am the body of Christ. I am the body of Christ. You have, Jesus broke it on his body and I am his body in the spiritual realm. Physically, it was trying to make me sick. Spiritually, it couldn't do anything to me. So I stood with the Spirit and brought that thing past, and eventually it just was gone. It took a day and a half, it was strong. It was a strong, strong attack, because the enemy comes and tries to attack us. But when you do that, you turn around and you start to stand on the Word, and you resist the devil, and he has to flee. It took a day and a half before he fled, but he fled. Now there's other areas in my life I'm still working on things, but in that area I've got it down pat. So the, the reality is every person has an area we're working on. So allow God to work on your area this day 
to be able to get you stronger in, in the truth and the knowledge that he has for us so that we can have a better life. But I just know that Psalms 91 is a good one to stand on, pro-quote it every day, put it out there. Why? Because it isn't going to, you know, the virus doesn't have to touch you because you are the body of Christ and Christ broke everything down. He's given us authority and power over that stuff. So praise the Lord. Well, we welcome that you're all here. We welcome you and we thank you for being here. It's good to see Mark back. <laughs> it's been a while since you've been here. Yeah, and we just praise God that uh, we're going to uh, go and see what the Lord is wanting to say today because I've been really praying and seeking the Lord, where are we going, what do we have happen? And he brought me back to the place where we're talking about, he said, why didn't the people, the Israelites, leave Egypt when they had a chance? Why didn't the Israelites leave Egypt when he had a chance? So I thought I'd go back and kind of evaluate this a little bit and see what I was, what the Lord would show me. To the beginning with this, I want to tell you one thing. God always makes a way out. I've done a teaching on that a while back. I should go back and check it out and redo that because I haven't done it for quite a while. God always makes a way out. There's no way that you can't go that he hasn't made a way out. That's his whole purpose, is to help us and to change us and bring us out of situations that we are in. It's interesting that when you look at what's going on in your life, there's a song, we don't sing it very often anymore, it says, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Why do you want to count your blessings? Sometimes you have to go back and see what God has done for you, saying that you're in the middle of something, saying, oh, well, God took care of it back here. He can take care of it again. Let's, so we have to reflect back on some of the things that God has done. And it went to Genesis 20 or 50, 20. As far as I'm concerned, this was Joseph talking, God turned into good what you meant for evil. Wow. God turned into good for what you meant for evil. Now, God is no respecter of persons, and if, if Joseph says that God turned into good what his brothers meant for evil, which was sold him, and he went through some hell, I'm not saying he didn't have some tough times, but he says, but God brought me to the high position I have today so I can save the lives of many others. Whew. Look back and see what God's doing in your life. What have you done? What have you gone through? And what can you do with it? Think about that. Joseph was just evaluating. He was, he was telling his brothers. His brothers, you know, the family came and they said, he's going to kill us because what we did to him. He had a heart of God, and he had seen what God had done for him. He says God sent him through all that just so that he could do something good for others. Do you see the things that you've gone through are so that you can help others? Are you going through something right now, and you're thinking, how good can this, anything good come out of this? Yeah. You're sitting here saying, wow, are you looking at it from the right perspective? But he said he brought me to a high position I have today so I could save the lives of many people. If I look back, you can see my book that I put out. You can look back and see the things that I went through. And I'm thinking, wow, this is horrible. And where I'm at today. I've helped many, many people in many, many ways through praying and seeking and talking to people, doing things. But I wouldn't have had that ability if I hadn't gone through some of the things I'd gone through. God didn't want me to go through them. That's another thing. That's a whole completely different story right there that you can go through and teach on. And we'll have to do that sometimes. But God will always make a way out. 
See, he, he gives you your heart's desire. What is your heart's desire? You might not be where you're at or you're supposed to be or where you want to be, but God will change that around. You have to give him some time. And I got thinking about it, and this is what the Lord started hitting me. He says, why didn't the people leave? And I went back and I was looking through. And I seen why the people did not leave. I'm thinking, wow. This is my concept. This is not my belief, what I'm seeing, what I'm understanding, what the Lord kind of gave me a revelation of. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that. And that was in Genesis 50, 23. And I'm just going to cut this down just a little bit so you can't go word for word on it. But this is kind of what I'd seen in it. He lived to see, and this is New Living Testament, he lived to see three generations of descendants, and he treated them as they were his own. This was Joseph. He's seen three generations, three generations of his descendants, and he treated them as they were his own. Think about that. If you were in a position in your life where you had somebody that was taking care of you, that had all the money, had all the food, gave you what you needed, gave you a job, gave you a position at a, at a place to work at, you didn't have a thing to worry about, you just had to go to work, get your money, have a place to live, enjoy your life, and have and out fun doing it, would you worry about leaving? Or would you be in a position of saying, man, this is, this, this is not a good place. I need to get out of here. I don't think so. I think they were, they were happy. They were satisfied. They had everything. They didn't need to worry about it. The kings was taking care of them. He's in good shape. So here are all these people. Three generations were there. And all three generations were taken care of. Sure, I'm, I'm sure they had to work. I'm sure they had things they had to do. I mean, their life probably wasn't perfect. But they were in pretty good shape. And I says, wow, I, I started to think about a man that told me once, there was a pastor in this one Sunday school, and he started talking about generations. And he pointed out, there's a generation that's called a pioneer. A pioneer goes in to a new place and develops, hunts, finds, develops, sets up, prepares. There's another generation called settlers. If you look at when the United States was settled, there was pioneers that went into some of the unchartered land. They found the land. They purchased it or whatever they had to do to get authority over it. Then they started to set it up to evaluate what was going on. They had kids. Especially if there's a husband and a wife, they ended up having kids. If they didn't have a husband and wife, they didn't have kids. But if they have, let's say they had husbands husband and wife and they had kids. Okay, so what happens is those kids became a generation of heirs. A generation of heirs. Heirs, are, or means settlers. Settlers are ones that took the land that was already explored and set up and started to, to redo it and make it, what do you want to say, tolerable? Comfortable? Yeah, see, they're developing what they had found. So you go in and you have a pioneer goes in, and then you have somebody comes in that comes after that that starts to develop it, to bring it into where... It needs to be. So they have a vision. The pioneer has a vision to find something new. There's a generation that has a vision to go in and take what they found and, and build it up and develop it into what needs to be. Then their children become heirs. Heirs are children that are a generation that comes in that has already had the pioneering done, the settling done, and then they just kind of live within the compounds of what's been going on. Now, have you ever watched a store, you know, and maybe a business in your lifetime, I've seen it many times, where you have a person that goes in and has a store, 
a business of any kind, and they build it up, and it's doing great. Everybody thinks it's fantastic. All of a sudden, the kids come in and take over. My father had a, a John Deere dealership and part ownership in it, and I grew up in it. I can kind of understand a little what's going on because I was always concerned. I didn't want to offend anybody, so in doing so, I didn't want to walk in and take over positions in the business and just start doing what I wanted to do. Because he had a partner, it was a little bit harder. If it had been just my father, it had been a little bit easier. But the reality, that's what happens. Kids come in because they already have a, you know, the, settle, the, the settlement's there. They've already, you know, they pioneered the business. They got it working. It's all settled. It's ready to go. And they come in, and now all of a sudden, they just want money and have fun and do what they want to do. And there's no pressure. There's no tension. There's no skin in the game, if you want to put it that way. No skin in the game. The pioneer had a lot of skin in the game. They had to go put out some tough times. I mean, some of the guys even died when they went in, into areas to get a new area set up. Even settlers died because of what was going on in the area people, uh, all the different things that can happen. But usually the heirs come along and that's already taken care of. They just have to take over what's already there so they can do what they want, how they want. There's no skin in the game. We had a uh, married for life course that we had, and, and in order to do that, you're supposed to pay $50 to go into the married for life course. And we said, great, that's not that bad, just some books. But some people didn't have 50 bucks to go through the course. And the people in charge says, do not give them money. There's a lot of times people say, well, I want you to go through this or go do this or go do that. He said, don't. So that's hard. I have compassion for people. I want to give people stuff. And we want to help get people through. And he says, okay, then make it to where they have skin in the game. Meaning they have to make some kind of an obligation to what they're going to do. He says, I don't care if they've got to pay $5 each week for 10 weeks to get 50 bucks. If they can give 5 bucks, let them give 5 bucks. We'll get the books to them, but we'll give, you know, they'll get the five bucks to you, and then all of a sudden, they'll have the money, you know. Because if you put skin in the game, it costs you something. And you or have a, a desire, a, a, you know, you, if you desire to do something, you don't have anything, you, know, you don't have any obligation to do it. Guess what? You go in, you do what you want, and leave. There's no, there's no obligations. And I said, wow, think about that. And we did. We had a, a couple that uh, somebody said, we're going to pay for it. We want them to go through it. They didn't make more than three or four weeks, and they were out. We had a 13-week course. Why? There's no skin in the game. Look at the, what they said up here. He said that he, you know, Joseph, had seen three generations go through. Three generations of descendants. And he treated him as he was his own. Now that makes me think that very possibly they were like the heirs. They didn't have to worry about it. It had already been settled. It had already been taken care of and set up. Joseph already did that. Joseph, you want to see, was a pioneer, believe it or not. If you start going through and doing what he did, he could have got in where he was at and turned violent and said, I'll just take them all out because they all hate me. But see, he had a heart of God. I heard a, a word here lately. It just blew me away. And if I can remember exactly what it was, I thought I wrote it down here, but I don't see where I have it. And it said, authority, when used with righteousness, brings life. Authority, when used with righteousness, brings life. Joseph was using his authority with his righteousness. Instead of being mad and upset about what they did to him, he changed it around and says, no, I forgive you. He walked in righteousness. And guess what? He produced life through them. 
He gave life to them. He could have killed them otherwise. I thought that was pretty interesting when I heard that. So are you using your authority with righteousness? We talked about righteousness many times. In fact, we even got a card. Righteousness is a right standing before God. Act or character according to the concordance. What it is, act or character. The character of God is love. I went back to the love chapter. And we put this out on our card. It's on the back. It's over there. You should have a card like that. Love is patient, kind, delights in truth, always hopes, always preserves. Now, are you kind to yourself? Are you patient to yourself? Are you kind to yourself? Do you light in truth? Are you always hopeful for everything to go right and always preserved? Preserves what's, what needs to be done. Love is not proud, envy, boast, rude, self seeking, easily angered, records kept of wrong, delight in evil. It will fail, it will fail you and let you down every time. There is no hope at all. If you're proud, envious, boast. You see, when, when you have love, you can do all things. You have the character of God. Praise the Lord. So I would say, the people that were there in Egypt were heirs. And heirs don't have to worry anything about, about anything. They aren't looking at the future. They aren't looking what's happening. They just see what they want to do. They go out and they do it and they have what's happening. I've seen that many times in businesses. And when that happens, the business goes down. It causes problems. But then I got down here and I got to thinking about it. But Moses. Moses knew when to leave. He got out of there fast. One thing I also talked about before is with the Israelites. They had everything they need. They were so blessed at that time when Jacob said that. They could have left immediately and they could have went and found their own land and done their own thing. They could have, they could have been praying and seeking the Lord what needed to happen. God knew that, that Joseph was going to die. He knew that he was going to be gone. He knew the torment that was going to happen to him. He had to. But they weren't worried about it because they're all sitting back here enjoying themselves because they got everything they need. Sounds like a lot of us in America. We got a, a lot of what we need. We don't have to worry about anything. Yes, there are needs out here, and there are financial needs. There's, there's things that are going on. We, you know, that we have to cons be concerned about. But in generally speaking, it's not like you have to be on your knees every day to make a li or to be able to live each day by being on knees and asking God to get you through that day. But he, you don't know what you've gone through to be able to take and be able to do. Just like Joseph did it. God is going to put you in a place to help you help others get better. Father, I come before you and I just thank you in the name of Jesus. I come against that spirit of death that is trying to hinder and hold what's happening here today. I felt the presence start to, to die down. And Father, this is a word from you. It's, it's not from me. I don't want to do anything that I have to do. I just want to do what you do. And Father, I know that many times we have to bind up the spirits that are coming against us. So we break that power, we break that authority, and we command it to flee right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask for the full anointing to fall. 
and to speak through this and to get through this process in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you want put out, Father, let me put it out. Father, not my words, but thy words, saith it. And I just give you glory, Father, in the name of Jesus. In Genesis 50, 24, Joseph said, Soon I will die. Joseph told his brothers, But God will surely come to you and lead you out of the land of Egypt. He will bring you back into the land he vowed to give to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, he did. He did. But here you are. You're in a land where you have a brother that is taking care of you. He is your bread and butter. There is no problems. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? He dies. Oh, terrible. He dies. Everything we had is gone. But it should say the same because we're still in this land. We still have our house. We still have all this, you know, wealth that we've gotten while Joseph was here. There's no problems. We'll just sit here and just wait. And we'll continue to have fun because, you know, he's just been good to us. Egypt's been good to us. We sit here and sometimes we're in the same predicament. We're just sitting there. Egypt was good to us. We're still in Egypt. We need to get out of Egypt. We need to move. There's, there's different understandings that the Lord wants to give you about if you're in Egypt yet or not. I sense that in the spirit. It's real strong. He did come. I tell you, at that time, I, in my opinion, if I was there, I wouldn't say, we need to be praying right now to see how God's going to deliver us quick, because if not, who knows what's going to take over this country and change everything. We've had that happen in our country. You know, what would happen if we did have uh, a socialist come in? Socialists usually do not like Christians. What would happen? Our lives would change. It's the same thing. We can sit back. Christians who trust God and love God and, and believe in God do not go in and vote is the same thing as saying what the Israelite did there. Because what happens is they can start to change the whole outlook on our country if we don't vote. Whoever gets in office is going to change a lot in our country. We've seen that down the road. We've had things happen. We were even at a meeting one time with Eric and it was a political meeting and there was one of the... Uh, I forget who it was that was there, but he was talking about it was our governor that caused the gender thing to change. Because he came up and he changed it from uh, male or female to gender. Because of that one word of gender, the political process picked it up and started to go gender instead of male or female. Now all of a sudden, look what everything's a gender thing. It's not not a male or female. We get more to it, but I'm not going to. I'm just stating that one politician changed the direction of what we were going. Wow. That can change a lot of things. Look what they did with the Israelite. As soon as Joseph was gone, immediately what happened? Another king came in, and they got fearful of the Israelites saying, hey, these peaceful people over here, they're doing fine. They aren't having anything. But they might rise up and come against us, and we've got to stop them before they do. Oh, that's Christians. Christians don't do anything. They don't cause any problems. They just sit back, do their main thing. But we've got to come against them and stop them because they might rise up and do something against us. They know different. I'm sorry. That's just what happens. They want to put you in a box. That's what one of the, the presidents, I forget which one it was. Eric would probably tell us. Why they came up with that understanding of having, or even Chris, by having that understanding of, well, if we can stop the preachers from talking, you know, quit them to talk about politics, we'll have more chance of winning. So they, they put us down and said, you can't use your, if you're going to talk about politics, you, we'll take your 503C away. So what happened was people quit talking about politics. Still now they've got it totally removed and, and President Trump has removed that from it. 
doesn't affect us anymore. We can talk about politics all we want. It's been tr proven and tested. People have got upset and said, hey, called the IRS and says, come watch me. I'm going to bring people in and we're going to talk about politics. We're going to do it on this day. We're waiting for you to come in and take it away from us. And they never showed up. When the, when the people stood up, guess what happened? It changed. When a president came in, he changed that. There's other things that's being changed. It's awesome what's going on. It can happen. So I'm just saying that here they are. They're sitting here kind of like, well, we just have everything given to us. We're taken care of. We just don't have any problems. And we're just going to keep going and doing what we got to do. And guess what? They got slammed. And I was saying, Lord, I understand now why. There's a possibility from what I'm seeing why they didn't leave when they had everything they needed, when they had everything going their way. Sometimes God gets us in a position and we can go. There's four different things I've always talked about. The enemy uses to destroy you. The first one is fear. It is fear. I don't care what happens, there is fear. Fear I'm not going to do this. Fear I'm not going to do that. He'll get you in fear. He's got you every time. Opens up the door. He gets a legal right to come in and cause you problems. Fear. Fear I don't have enough. Fear I can't do this. Fear I can't do that. That doesn't line up with the word of God. God is not the author of fear, but a love, peace, and a sound mind. But we live in fear a lot of times. I've lived in a lot of fear through my life. Shouldn't have, but I did. I'm getting better all the time. Still a few areas I'm still working on, so pray for me. I need all the prayer I can get. We're, I'm, none of us are perfect. Praise God, if we were, we'd be in heaven already. We'd been God, and, and you wouldn't want to be under me. I would not probably do you a very good job. So praise God, we got a God that is awesome. <laughs> and he loves us. Whew. I'm glad he does. I'd been out a long time ago. <laughs> praise God, praise God. We're just enjoying. So anyway, why were the people waiting? What was happening? Why didn't they immediately go and say, God, we don't know what's happening here, but Joseph is gone. You put him in there to protect us. He has done an awesome thing for us, even though his brother sold him, but you opened up the door to bring him clear around to take us and keep us and watch over us. Now he's gone. Now we don't know what's going to happen. So what are we supposed to do? Should we stay here? And just keep on the blessings that we got? Or should we take everything we got and leave? Didn't happen. I don't know if that all went on. But see in my own mind. That's what I keep thinking. Why didn't they leave? Why did they? They said they had everything they needed. They were wealthy. They were comfortable. They were comfortable. There it is. They're very comfortable. See and that's what happens when you get the generation of air. Airs become comfortable. They don't have to worry about stuff. You look at our generations. My father, grandfather, he kept things, I don't know why he kept them, but because he went through the war. He kept everything. I mean, we went out to the farm. I loved going to the farm with my grandfather. He had a, a farm. He had migraine headaches so bad he, he would go home he had to get off the farm because he couldn't handle it. At that time, what he had to do was he'd go home at noon. He'd be go out in the morning and work on the farm. Then he'd come home. He had somebody who, he, a landlord that came in that kind of took over. He just had somebody take, take care of the land and the farmhouse. So somebody lived there. So he'd go out there and he'd work on, on what was on the buildings and stuff. But he would come home at noon. He would have hot tea, burnt toast, scrape the burn off and eat it and he'd lay down for an hour and he wouldn't have a hot he wouldn't have a migraine that's how he lived so when i got old enough i started going out with him we had a great time going out there we had a fun time we'd go out and help repair buildings and put stuff up and hedgehogs hedge balls whatever they call them pick those things up in the fall stinky stuff <laughs> horrible <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we had fun. It's a good thing to remember. We went out there, and he took my 
22 rifle, and he would throw up cans that was thrown out in the ditch where they always burnt stuff, and there was 10 cans there. And he'd throw them up, and I'd shoot them in the air. Just had all kinds of fun. You know, Grandma would make the pies. He'd eat a fourth, and I'd eat the rest. <laughs> so <laughs> we had a blast. You know, it, cookies were better sometimes than pies, but pies were good. So, I mean, we were in good shape, and, and I just loved my grandfather. But he did it differently because he grew up in a generation that was different. I remember the first time I went out to his house, he still had the old pump in the house. Had to pump the water in, his, in the kitchen sink. So he lived in a different time zone. And then my father, he was talking about how he had to walk, I don't know, like five, six miles to school, and they're always talking about that, walking over the snows, over the fence, and all that stuff. He said when he got older, he was lucky. He says he had a, a school bus with teams of horses. So he, he would use the wagon school bus to take kids to school with the, with the horses. So he's doing pretty good. Then it got a little bit more modernized, and he found a, a school bus with a motor in it. So he started doing that. But he also said it got fathered in. Because the grandfather in back there, you know, what happens is they don't have, didn't have license, didn't need license at first, but then they started having license, so they just grandfathered him in because they've been doing the school bus for a long time for that, you know, point. So he took, and that's what he did. So he got a, he never did go get a test. I think one time he did when he got older, he forgot to get it renewed, and he had to go back and take a test. But uh, other than that, he'd been grandfathered in, didn't have any tests. But see, that was different. But he, he also came from that time of toughness. So he kept everything. He wasn't a hoarder like some people become, but he, is, he kept everything. I mean, all your nuts and bolts and, and wood pieces and all that stuff. There was all over the house, and then he, he maintained, he kept everything. He was a very excellent mechanic. He could fix anything, even up to the point where he died. In his 90s, was out working on tractors. And it was pretty awesome, but he had a different generation. But then my generation came along, and we didn't have nearly what they had to do or to achieve. It was all there. We just went out and had fun and enjoyed ourselves. We, we didn't have to use uh, the washing machine. The washing machine was there. We didn't have to do it the hard way. You know, we didn't have Maytag motors on our washing machines. It was all enclosed, and the electric was good. And well, I even remember the first TV that we got was black and white. We thought we were in really good stuff. And then we finally got our colored TV, and that was really awesome. And back then, we didn't eat, go to restaurants very much simply because we didn't want, we ate at home. Had good food. Pop bottles, this big. Man, we were blessed to have a pop bottle. To get a little pop now and then. You know, and eventually my mom gave us some money, and we'd go down as kids to a little grocery store down here, and there was like rock candy. Oh, I love that rock candy. I don't know. I haven't had it for a long time. Oh, they're on strings. And eat this rock candy. That's good stuff. Yeah, we get, you know, a little bit. No, some are saying, no, we don't like rock candy. But I did. And rock candy was good. We probably have some other good candies out there, too. Had a lot of good stuff down there. So we'd get, a, you know, a few pennies to go down and pick up pennies. What would a penny buy today? We'd go down and pick up some stuff. We were blessed. We just walked down. Mom got out of mom's hair for a while. So we went down and we, we played outside more and we were inside watching TV. So, but then that's our generation. But our generation, I had people have said, I'm not going to treat my kids like my kid parents treated me. Of course, most of them were because they went to church and they didn't want them to go to church. So they, they just kind of backed off and didn't go to church anymore. My father, he would always sit there at the table and before we would eat until the window got put in to watch the TV outside and mom didn't want to watch or didn't sit there at the table anymore. She wanted to go sit at the, and watch the TV. So she started, that TV trays were d developed during that time period. So they could eat by the TV. But, you know, with a prayer that Dad had and the reading of the Word disappeared. But my father never changed. He stayed by the table. And he always prayed and he always read the Word. He kept on going. So he was still my example. Do I do it today? Eh, not as good as I should. So the fact is, when it comes down to We've lost a lot through the generations. Now, I seen a commercial the other day. It was a secret. It says, we, don't tell anybody, but we got this place over here. It's brick and mortar. 
and you can drive to it and you can walk in and you can sit on your furniture to find out what it feels like before you buy it. <laughs> Have you seen that commercial? <laughs> I haven't seen that one. That was pretty cool when I seen that commercial. I, when I heard the brick and mortar places are coming down, I'm thinking, why are the brick and mortar, why are they losing business? Because our generation is so lazy, they don't want to go anywhere. They just want to go on the internet and buy everything. Well, I hate to say it, I like it. It's easier that way. We haven't had our food brought in that way yet, but I, that's out there. You know, you don't have to do or worry about it. You don't have to go to the grocery store anymore. You just call the grocery store and they come to you. That'll help with coronavirus. There you go. <laughs> so, but the generations, they keep changing. See? And I, I did have one pastor tell me once, he says, the, it's the fourth generation that God gets a hold of. The first generation is on fire for God. The second generation comes in, just like I said, the settlers, they kind of get through and they, they like it, but they... You know, they kind of help set up Sunday schools and do that stuff. And, the, and their generation, the next generation, the third generation comes in, and they just, it's their heirs. They're just sitting back just taking, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to enjoy anything because I don't have any skin in the game. And all of a sudden, they don't even start to go to church, and nothing happens, and they just go do their own things. And then God takes and grabs that fourth generation, puts them on fire. I'm believing that the fourth generation is right ahead of us. I believe these young People today, once they get on fire, it's going to be so strong, it's just going to blow the doors wide open on everything. They're going to be just like back in the old days when Jesus was walking here. All the things are going to happen. I'm expecting that to go on. So praise the Lord. Sometimes you ask, where is God? But it takes time to prepare the way out. God has to raise up a person to deliver God's people out of Egypt. Just think about that. Here Joseph dies. The king gets mad. Wants to kill all the, the Israelite boys. God saves Moses. Sits him right in the king's house. Raises him up. And then all of a sudden, he prepares him through that whole situation to do what? To bring Israel out of Egypt. But see, it was a series of time to go through this. And I'm thinking, if, if the king got bad and started going out and started to go crazy, weren't the Israelites crying out to God, why don't you come get us and take us out of this place? God gave them the ability to pull out of the place first, but they didn't do it because they were waiting because they were so used to having people taking care of them. Our body of Christ sometimes is the same way. We'd rather have somebody take care of us than actually stand up and do what we're supposed to do. And I pray that changed too, because in the revival fire that's coming, it's going to change. People are going to stand up and start to do more of what they're supposed to be doing. I said, wow, just think about what's happening. Think of the time limit that it took from there to here. The time limit of there to here. I was talking with somebody just lately, and they're kind of in limbo, and they're saying, man, I just, I just got to be doing something for God, and I just don't know what's happening. I just, and, and they were going on and on, and I'm thinking, you know, there was a teaching one time that I heard from an apostle, and he said this. He brought up in the meeting two young men, stood them right there, and he said, uh, these are the two men that actually, out of the 12, that said we can take the promised land. Joshua, was it? Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, that's right. Thought I had that one right, I just wanted to make sure. Joshua and Caleb. And all of a sudden, because the people rejected him, they rejected what they said, and there was more people more fearful than there were believing God's word, they were then pulled into a 40-year time period. A 40-year time period, even though they were right. They were prepared. They were ready. They couldn't have gone by themselves and done it. But what happened? They took, and he says, I want to show you that right here was where they're ready to go into the promised land. And they couldn't go. 
So he said, I want you two to go sit down. So he had the two young men go down. He had two older men come up. And he said, right here. And he had them standing right in line, right in front of him. And he says, now, 40 years later, the same two men. And he put his foot down on the ground and went, boom. And he said, the same calling, the same gifting that they were supposed to do 40 years earlier was still there. Now I'm releasing you to go do what you're called to do. Took them 40 years to get to the place where they can actually do what they're called to do. 40 years. If you start to look at right now, many of the people that are out there, the, the people that you listen to and hear, the majority that I've heard here, oh, it's been a while back, started blowing me away. They started to learn and understand in the 1980s, early 1990s when they started to grow. You look at many of the pastors that you list on TV, many of the, the people that are out there prophesying, going crazy. If they start to find out, because I didn't hear that until one day I, I started hearing the people start saying, yeah, back in 80 when I started to learn this. And I'm thinking, Lord, you're showing me a pattern. It was in 1980 when it started. I started in 1980. I got up here and I said, Lord, don't wait till I'm 70 years old until I get into ministry and make something happen. I'm thinking, God knows what he's doing. I don't. But anyway, you take it and come up here and boom, all of a sudden, all this is starting to come to pass. And I sit here and I say, Lord, I don't understand this. But see, he has to make a way. He has to get things lined up. He's getting things lined up like he's never had things lined up before. He is setting things up. He is coming in. The prophecy that we heard from Kent Christmas 2020 is powerful. I'm hearing it from other people. It's coming out the same way. It's doing the same thing. And when we get through and we start to see God is on the move, he is starting to change. He is taking back America. I remember when I was getting prepared and ready there, uh, Sharon, many years ago, was sitting there and talking about it. And he, she was saying this. God will not let America go down the tubes. He won't pull the plug and let it go down the drain. We'll never let that happen because it was a, it was a nation that was set up for God. And it was God's people that came that way. And she went through the whole process. She talked about Germany and she had the figures with the with all the different, I mean, there was an eagle and there was all these other things that she came up with. We have to go back and look at her teaching. She was powerful and right on time with it. She says, God's never going to let America go down the tubes. But yet, prophets sit there and say, oh, God's judging, judging, judging. Yes, I believe they are judging. But I believe God's got a better plan. And he's going to bring this thing around even greater than we've ever had before. Even though there's chaos going on, God turns chaos into peace. That's what the kingdom of God is supposed to do. We're supposed to walk in peace. We're supposed to operate in peace. We're supposed to make peace. But the kingdom of God, you walking in the love of God, in the peace of God, in the Holy Spirit of God, in the power of God, should bring peace in everything that you do, everything that you say, everything that happens. Turning chaos into peace is what God wants to do. So he's raising people up to do this. It's taking time. You might say, well, what's going on in my life? I said, I don't know. You have to ask God what's going on in your life. But you might be in a waiting period for he prepare things so that you can do things like you've never done before. Well, why did I go through all that stuff? It doesn't matter what you went through. You go back to the scriptures and it says, count it all joy when diverse temptations come upon me. For it's a working of your patience. I went back and I looked up patience. Because I haven't looked up patience in the concordance. I know what patience is. I don't ask for patience. Because I did that once. And uh, God made me uh, try to get patient. Because I had to be very patient with what was happening. He helped me out. I don't ask for patience. I believe I got patience. And I try to work with patience. But I went back and looked it up, and it said in the concordance, it says, putting to proof. Ooh, doggies. Let me have patience. Put it to proof how I can have patience, Father. Put me in the hospital for a week, and I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm going to say, well, I, get me out of here. you got to have patience. I'm teaching you patience. 
I'm teaching you patience. I don't want patience. I want you to give it to me. No. That's not what my word says. The word says in James 1, 2, my brother, count it all joy when diverse uh, temptations, uh, when, when you fall into diverse temptations, I'll get it right, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your, you're asking for patience, you're asking to have your faith tried. Woo! Guess what? You got something coming down the pike you don't want to know about. See, when you see the word and understand it, you'll say, I don't ever want to ask for patience because I don't want to be tried. Now, Lord, help me to build my faith in you by your word to believe that the patience will be there when it happens. I don't know if anybody agrees with me or not, but I believe that's the way it says. Because it says it's trying of your patience. It says, but let her have her perfect work. That may be or you may be perfect, entirely wanting nothing. And I'm thinking, wow. And then it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given. You, is patient given you? Wisdom gives you. What is wisdom for? To go through the trial that is trying to work your patience. Get the wisdom to go through the trial. That's why I say God's made a way out. I've seen that picture. You've probably seen it. The guy's standing in the middle and the waves are all the way up around. That's a trial. The waves are all the way around you and you're standing right in the middle. Don't look at the wave. Look at the end because at the end there's a hole. That's the way out. That's where the word is. The word will drive you, bring you to that end and you'll walk through that. And you'll say, Wow. Not saying it's going to be easy. Not saying it, it's going to be fun. It just that it can happen. And I said, "Wow, what did patient mean?" When I seen that, it says putting, putting to proof. Think about that. Putting to proof. Then I turned around, and I had a man one time a long time ago, a Coleman Lackey. I talked about him before. He was talking about, I want you to read that. He says, what does it say there? It says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that is, uh, the testing of your faith uh, worketh patient, but let her perfect work. But let patient have her perfect work. Her. He says, it's a female. So, I should say a female. I'll get that wrong. I'm sorry about that. I gotta watch what I'm doing. Yeah, all this gender's got me all messed up. Female, it's a her. And he says you got to see as like a woman in receiving, and then as it receives, there's a time of growth, and then there's a time of birthing. Let her have her patience in you. Now, wait a minute. Think about that. There's a process. People say, I want patience. Just give it to me. I'll go out and have fun. I'll just be patient with everybody. No. No, no, no. Anybody, have been, anybody around that's been pregnant, a lady that's been pregnant, or any lady that's been pregnant, you know it's not that easy. It takes a while for it to be developed and brought forth. And that's what the Lord is saying in here. Let her have her perfect work. Let it be developed. Let it come forth. And then when you have it, you have to nurture it and prepare it and keep it going. Because as a child comes forth, you can't just say, oh, here's my child, here's patience. And forget about it. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to die out. You have no patience. And it was interesting when I heard that many, many, many years ago. I'm thinking, Wow. When you start to see some of the understanding that's going on. But you, patience is not easy. It, it's a process. It takes a while to develop. Anybody disagree with that one? Wow. And I said that was amazing what was going on there. Then in Exodus 3, 7, 
New Living Testament. So you want to read that one, 3, 7 through 10. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and led them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is the land of flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Could you imagine the people of Israel crying out to God, Why haven't you delivered me? These people are bad. They're bad. What does it say? And the Lord told him, You can be sure I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cries for deliverance from the harsh slave drivers. Well, why would it take so long for him to get things going? It all comes down to one thing. He's made a way out. He's made a way out. Sometimes his timing on ways don't work. I've been mean, listening to some prophecies again. And one person said he'd seen the Lord walking down the beach. And he had a, a torch with him. And he says it's just like he had no understanding of time whatsoever. Another one was talking about how God's timing is different than ours. I heard another person that said the timing of the Lord is so different than what we have. One person said that he did something and he said he did it like five minutes ago and they said no it was three years ago in God's time. See in our time it felt different but in, in God's time it's different. God's timing is not the same as ours. He might be working on something right now in his timing to get you delivered from where you're at or things that are happening. So you have to considerably remember that God's timing is different than our timing. If you go back to scriptures and say, where's that proven at? Well, what does it say about one hour? Was it one day is like a, a thousand, you know, a thousand years? One day is like a thousand years. That's, that's some weird different timing here. And we had a man that was a, a Satanist. Or not, he was working, he was a, a warlock actually. And he said that he got in when he was seven years old into witchcraft. And he got out when he was 13 years old. And I said, wow. He says, you must have been, did your family travel? all over the world during that time period. He says, no. But he says, I had ley lines, and I would travel down the ley lines. And the ley lines are in the spiritual realm. They, they might sound weird. I've, I've learned about a lot of this stuff. I don't get into it much. But he said it when it blew me away. He says, yeah, him and a, a, a gal that they used to, to astral project down these ley lines and one time they hit one ley line and they missed and they went into hell. He said, we were there for two years. I said, two years? In the spiritual realm, it's different. We can't comprehend it with our mind. Because it's different, it's spiritual. And he says, yeah, I said, how can you be there two years? He says, I was there two years. But then we finally found the whole back out and I got back out and we came back. But he was from seven years old to 13 years old, he'd been involved in that. He's right here in Des Moines. So when he went to hell that was before he was 13? Mm -hmm. Before he was 13. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, I start hearing some of the things from the spiritual realm I don't get into because it can scare people like crazy. But the Lord wants me to understand and know because it is a spiritual understanding. But I, I was just amazing when, when they said it was two years, I'm thinking, two years? It might have only been 15 minutes in our time, but in the time of the spiritual realm, it was two years. So you might say, 
It's been a long time. I said 20 years I mean, in 1980, early 80s. I said, I'm sick and tired of Christians losing the victory. What's it going to take? It took me all the way to 2003 before the Lord really gave me the full revelation and told me to start doing something about it. See, it's just like Joshua and Caleb. It took them 40 years before they could do what God wanted them or what they wanted to do. It took them 40 years to do what they wanted to do. The average person that, like I said, as the main person that's out there today that's doing the ministries, if you talk to them, a majority of them will probably say around 1980, 90 is when they started to learn what they're learning and are now doing what they're doing. That's some time. But in God's time, it wasn't. He was preparing those people back then to do what needed to be done now. You might be being prepared, and he might not be through with his preparation to get you where you need to be. Trust him. Believe him. Ask for wisdom. Ask for knowledge. See what's going on. I just know there's a word here for people. Don't be upset. Don't get ahead of God. Listen to what he's saying. Because he's made a way out. Of every situation that you're in, he's made a way out. Take and ask for wisdom. And ask God to show you where, what, how, when. Because he has a plan of purpose for you. God loves you. He cares about you so much. He wants you out of every situation just as much as you want to be out. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in ourselves, we kind of forget about some other things. I hope this is a word of encouragement to you to allow you to understand God's still working. He never stopped. He's still working. He's wanting to change everything in your life for a better, no matter what's going on. It might seem impossible. It's not impossible with God. Because, see, when you have joy, and if you're looking for something and it's not coming by, you've lost your joy. Because it takes it out. The devil wants to steal your joy. If you've lost joy today, I pray that you get joy back. I do it many times. I says, God, I've lost my joy. Help me get my joy back. Because without joy, I have no strength. For God, for the, you know, count it all joy when diverse comes upon you. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So how can you have strength if you don't have joy. How can you have strength if you don't have joy? And that's one of the biggest things the devil's trying to do right now is take the joy out of people's lives. We need the joy back in our lives. We need to be jumping and jumping and praising just like when we found out a dear brother that passed away. We're not joyful in the passing away, but we're joyful in having joy for God. That he has taken him home, that he's rejoicing with him, that we'll see him again someday. We praise the Lord. We rejoice that God is on the throne and doing what he needs to do. And when we remember that, we start to work that way, then we're going to start to see how God is doing some awesome things. And we kind of get away from looking at our sad situation that's going on sometimes, hard situation that we're going through, and we say, Lord, give me your joy, show me your wisdom, See what you're doing so that we can continue on and be where we need to be. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I know the enemy wanted to stop this word. But I know forth that you are not wanting the word stopped. You wanted it to come forth. That God has made a way out of everything that you have done, everything that you're doing, everything you're going through. There's not one thing that God is not trying to make a way out to improve and bring joy into your life and happiness, to help others change, to do even greater than you've ever done before. We just pray that we lock upon our hearts upon the Lord and allow him to continue to move in our lives to make us even more servants for you, Father. It keeps coming down to two things in this season that's going to change people's lives dramatically. That is, if you love yourself. That you love yourself. 
so that you can love others. And that you have, that you humble yourself. Humble. If you humble yourself and you love yourself, I guarantee the authority that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us through the kingdom of God will take and work through righteousness and it shall bring life. Life in your life, life in others, life around you, life around you. I just go back and I, I'm seeing in the vision where the man stood with a sword and the atmosphere was horrible. And he took the word of God and he started to twirl it around above him just by speaking the word of God, using the word of God. And all of a sudden, the air cleaned up. The air cleaned up. The air cleaned up. The air cleaned up. See that vision every time you have something, everything that's going on. The Bible would say, put on a, a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Maybe you know some words, some of the scriptures that are out to song. Sing them. Take that sword and swing it around above your head. Allow God to move. Allow the word to be used. There's a heavy anointing that's falling. A heavy anointing is falling. The river is here. The river and the fire of God is here. Father, I just come before you. I thank you for being in this place. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the river that's flowing. I thank you for this word that came forth as those are in areas that are tough. I thank you be with a family of Bernard that are going through the loss of their father, their husband, their grandfather. friend, brother in Christ. We give you glory this day. We thank you for what you're doing. I ask that you be with each and every person here. I ask that you keep them and protect them. Father, this virus has no authority over them, and we give you glory for full protection. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let not the chaos touch your children, but let the peace wisdom and knowledge continue to move through each and every one. Father, until we meet again, in the name of Jesus, amen.